We spend a lot of time on this segment talking with experts about ways they're addressing the cyber talent crisis. But today I wanna to tackle the issue, is the, is the talent shortage really as bad as we think? To have this discussion, I'm joined today by Rick Howard, the CyberWire's Chief Analyst, and Ben Rocky, Senior Information Security Manager at Experian. Hi, gents, thanks for joining. Hey, Hello. Simone, thanks for doing this. All right. Well, let's just jump right in. Um, ben, I know you've tackled this question. So is there really a cyber job shortage? Uh, yes, you know, but, but I think, you know, with a caveat, I mean, a lot of the, uh, there's a lot of reports, um, you know, p press releases, et cetera, about millions of, uh, of cybersecurity jobs. Um, so the, the short answer is yes, it, it's definitely, it's a great career path. There's a lot of openings. But it's not that uh, people could take a, uh, a, a crash course and get a high paying job in information security. Darn, uh, companies wish, need people. Really? Companies I'm shocked. Shocked, I say. Okay. <laughs> uh, yeah, I mean, I'm saying, you know, I, th I wrote an article about it, you know, a month ago, and it got a, uh, a uh, it reverberated, you know, quite well. And pretty much, I, I get calls, you know, weekly from parents, from people. I want, you know, uh, they've got college age kids, there's other people in IT that want to get into information security. And uh, it's a great career. Yeah, there's a lot of opportunity. But once again, it's not this magic bullet where you could uh, you know, take a boot camp and companies are going to be desperate uh, for your services. Uh, I think that's the difference. So is there a uh, is there a lot of openings? Yes. But companies are um, uh, are quite judicious, you know, in their hiring. Um, Rick and I have a, a friend, Helen Patton. She wrote a book about um, getting into the, the field, and she says uh, that you know there is no such thing as uh, entry level information security jobs. Um, and, and for the most part, that is correct. Is that you know companies you know want people who are experienced. Even an entry level job you know requires a lot. And I think one misnomer. Is that is is you know thinking you could just do information security? Information security is built on top of IT. So if you don't understand networks, if you don't understand protocols, servers, uh, if you don't understand risk, yeah, you know someone could take a course and they could do uh, you know run scripts and do stuff, but they're not going to be a, a valued part of the information security team. Yeah. In some ways, uh, information security is like uh, a medical specialty. First, you do internal medicine, then you do your specialty. No, no one just goes an analogy. straight. I've used that analogy for years, Ben. We're, we're yeah. simpatico on that one. Um, I want to get back to the entry level piece, but before we do, I thought you brought up something really interesting, which is that like the numbers are endemically overreported. And it's something I have noticed in some of the things that we've seen in the data sets that are available and cited. And something that's always struck me my background's in the defense contracting space. So I know even when I think about the amount of federal cyber and defense cyber jobs that are being bid in the DMV alone, you know, I think about every contractor that's putting out recs for the same job postings. Mm -hmm. If we're using that as the data point, I'm like, we've just quadruple counted because everyone's putting up postings for the same singular role. It's just mm -hmm. getting replicated four times. Yeah, I think the number is, last time I looked, was 3.5 million job openings, right? And uh, uh, and it seems to grow every year, okay? And you're right, Ben, I, um, these are not entry-level jobs. Uh, what we're, But I think that's our fault, okay? We're the security professionals here, and for years we've insisted that we're not going to hire newbies for a specific task, you know, not the overarching, you got to be an expert in DevSecOps or chaos engineering or whatever it is, okay? But, and we've insisted that these new employees have, you know, 20 years experience and 17 certs, and therefore we don't hire them. Um, and I'm wondering what you think about that is that we could be very judicious here if we were smart about hiring newbies coming off the street uh, and give them very uh, specific things to do. And I wonder if that fixes the problem. Yeah, I mean, it's, I think it's a, there's a lot of, uh, you know, issues, uh, a lot of things involved. It's not, uh, you know, it's not like, uh, you know, my, I've got a, a leak in my car tire, you know, patch it and it's done. 
Uh, you know, there's a, a lot of issues, and even getting back to that number, even, you know, I heard, figure, you know, a million job openings in in the U.S. I mean, if you think about it, you know, that would mean almost like 1% of Americans uh, are in information security. Uh, but I think there's a lot of things, you know, going on is that there is, the short answer is there is no quick fixes. Um, information security is, uh, it's broad, it's deep. And, um, you know, 30, 40 years ago, um, one of the classic books, you know, The Mythical Man Month mm -hmm. uh, was written. And so when it comes to software development, you know, just throwing people at a problem not only will not uh, make a, a software development project uh, and quicker, it, it complicates things. So there's uh, a lot of things going on. It's just there's the, the supply, there's the demand, uh, there's training aspects. Um, and so there's a lot there. So anyone... Um, and we, you know, we've got this problem even in in Wall Street. You know, one bad quarter could sink a company. They're thinking far too short term. You know, companies need to think uh, a bit longer term. And a lot of uh, bigger companies are doing that. They're creating programs to train existing IT staff, bring them uh, into their you know security groups. Um, you know, Citibank, you know, J.P. Morgan, Boeing. A lot of the big you know the Fortune 1000s are doing that. But, you know, whatever, you know, 80 percent of American companies are, are on the small side. And when you're uh, a hundred person operation, you know, they don't have the budgets to, uh, you know, create an internal training program. So some of it can be done um, holistically internally. But, you know, for a lot of the companies, you know, they don't have the, uh, the wherewithal to do that. I think another issue is, um, as it is, you know, just good actuarial numbers about the job openings doesn't exist. A lot of it is done being, you know, done being, I found by, by surveys. A lot of things are predictions quoted as, you know, actuarial numbers. So that, that adds to it. But, yeah, I said there's, there's a lot of uh, different things going on, and there is no one thing to fix this shortage. Right. I'm, I'm curious, though, because it really sticks with me, too, in the work we've done around this idea of the, like, short-term realities and companies that kind of focus on here's what I need yesterday and so I don't have the advantage or the luxury to invest in those training programs or those upskilling programs versus the reality that if we don't do those things there is no way to ever grow this pool of talent regardless of what the actuarial number of mm -hmm. shortfall of jobs is. So what has to happen culturally and in I assume these large companies they've got to lead the charge from my perspective. I think it's, you know, it's, it's a bit of a, I remember got a, a, a bill, you know, in, in the old days when you used to pay bills with a, in an envelope from the, the AAA, um, their envelope said, uh, I think, you know, auto safety doesn't cost, it pays. Um, I think so too with information security. It doesn't cost, it pays. It is an investment. And... Um, you know, there was yeah, a, ben, we, a, we don't treat it that way as an industry. I, you know, yeah, it's... Because, you know, my experience is uh, when we train employees, existing employees, we never do it with the idea that we're going to improve the team. That's not the primary consideration, right? It is, yeah. We're going to, it's usually a perk. You know, Kevin, he did a great job last year on that project. We're going to send him out to Black Hat as a reward to further his career. But what it really should be is the security leadership deciding we're going to improve how well the team performs on our particular strategy. And that's a culture shift for all of us because none of us do it that way. Yeah, as I said, you know, there's a lot. I mean, we need to invest in the people. You need to invest in the products and the technology and processes in all of these. I mean, the I mean, the recent Caesars hack, you know, the numbers are going to be 100 million. It'll probably go up in the end. It'll probably cost them, you know, half a billion dollars. Um, but I think, you know, it's sort of the mindset of, of a lot of things are, uh, is, you know, people don't focus in that long term, meaning, you know, uh, even, you know, health insurance, you know, they'll pay for uh, years of dialysis, you know, but they won't pay to, uh, you know, have this person, you know, see an, a nutritionist in their teen years. Mm. So it, 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 as it is, I think information security in some ways is really, you know, not that different from IT, from society as a whole, but... I said it's gotten to that point. You really can't ignore it anymore. I mean, it used to be, you know, you'd read uh, these information security horror stories, you know, once a quarter. You know, now it's it's weekly. I mean, there's clo I mean, in the last week. I mean, 
there's Clorox, there's Caesars, there's MGM. So companies are slowly getting it, but it's like the proverbial uh, aircraft carrier. You know, these things are, are huge and big, and you know, you want to make a change and a turn, you know, it does take a while. But uh, even with the new SEC guidance, that's changing things significantly. So um, in some ways, information security, we're inherently, um, uh, you know, we always, you know, focus on, uh, on risk and you always see, uh, you know, the um, the dangers and everything. So I think there is a lot of uh, a lot of good things going on. Information security is now at the board level. There's a lot of investment, uh, but yeah, it's but still, the, these the things take a while to to fix. The culture change, though, Ben, that I'm talking about, right, is that when you have a budget for training, and it's tra it's and it's earmarked for you know career progression. Okay, that's the first thing that gets cut when times get short, when times get tough. But yeah, if this, yeah go ahead. Yeah. No, and, and Ricky, I think you really said an operative word. It's what, how is it tied to a strategy? Yeah. Just having a budget, it's easy to cut a budget for training when it's a perk because that's what it's viewed as, is yeah. a perk. And so you take away the perk because you do that. If it's not tied to a talent strategy, a people strategy, or, I think, or uh, you know, not to toot my own horn, but a first principle cybersecurity yeah. strategy, right? right? So if your if your strategy is I don't know resilience, like it is here at the CyberWire, okay, we need people that know how to do resilience, and I could take yeah. uh, budget decisions, resource decisions to the you know to Simone, my boss, and say you spend three thousand dollars on this, I can buy down risk with that, right? As opposed to you know, it's Kevin getting a you know a pat on the back because he did a good job last week. Yeah, I think that gets you know into the another issue. You know, it is creating the you know return on security investment. You know, that is a a challenge. You know, as it is uh, getting real. You know, getting back. You know, actuaries are great. You know, they're able to um, do what they do. Um, uh, if you're familiar with fair factor analysis of information risk, that you know that's a great method to show and quantify that but even even getting those good numbers you know getting really good metrics um you know that that's an effort in and of itself but uh yeah a lot of things can be cut but you know in in office buildings you know no one says hey times are tough you know we've got to uh, cut back on electricity you know we've got to cut back on plumbing uh, because you know you can't do that um and so to information security really is no different i mean uh, Right. But, you know, it's but it's it's a really good point when you think about the amount of budgets that's spent on, especially the operating budget spent on headcount. That is by far the largest amount of budget spend is ultimately on people. And yet we have this fixation with calculating return on investment on technology and process improvements. It's hard to capture metrics. There are ways to try and capture metrics, but it's very core. You can break down the cost differential of what it takes to invest in someone, train them up versus what it costs to either make a decision to hire very experienced, expensive talent or, you know, identify outsourced providers. Like those are numbers that exist that yeah. you can make comparatives against. Right. So Simone and I have been batting around an idea called Moneyball for Workforce Development. All right, this is basically Billy Bean deciding that he's going to buy three players for $200,000 whose, whose first principal metric is get on base versus Jason Giambi that they paid $7 million for who was an all-star player in all areas. And he basically realized you can replace Giambi in the aggregate with three cheaper players. And that's what we're suggesting here is that you could bring in newbies from, you know, recently college graduates or even transitioning government employees who are looking for a new career who have no experience but a hunger to learn something new, all right, and train them on one or two things that are essential to your InfoSec program and demonstrate to leadership that you can buy down risk with that approach. And that might go to... Um, filling that gap in all those open jobs we were talking about. Yeah, I think there's a, you know, there's a lot of, uh, you know, a lot of good ways, you know, to address it. I mean, there's, you know, s you know, scores of different ways. And I think one of the, uh, you know, one of the, you know, is, you know, one of the things about security is, you know, there's a lot of people who actively want to get in this field. You know, there's a lot of people uh, in IT who are transitioning. And so the good news is I, there is a lot of people um, 
uh, who are interested. But as I said, is you know, a lot of companies you know want someone to do it today, not uh, you know three six months from now. And it does take uh, uh, that forward thinking. You know, they want their Jason Giambi who could you know uh, sell out stadiums today. Um, you know, bring in the crowds, do all of that. But um, once again, it, it's a calculation. It does take a, a forward thinking uh, leadership approach, and it is a, a challenge. On one side, you have to have a long term approach and strategy. On the other side. You know, you have day to day, you know, day to day operations. So, I mean, no, uh, it, it's a challenge. It, it's it's juggling, and you know, companies got to do the best they can. Right. Well, so let me ask the the really tough question here because there is so much national executive branch level attention on this issue. The White House issued their strategy on cybersecurity workforce. Think tanks like the Aspen Institute have been focused on creating cybersecurity workforce working groups all around kind of the, the talent shortage overall. Ultimately, when we think about this conversation around the big companies, who's investing in these long-term approaches? How do you balance the short-term day-to-day needs versus this long-term? Who ultimately bears the burden? Because I think that's one of the things I really struggle with. If we're looking at this as a national security level type of priority, and then we look to companies or independent you know, private organizations to self-select into creating good strategies, which is a completely, you know, free market capital type of societal approach, but it hasn't been working for us so far. So like, who, who are we going to put the, the, who are we going to pin the rose on here? It's a great question. <laughs> <laughs> I think, uh, I've stumped us all. <laughs> I think someone said, uh, you know, a lot, you know, going in, into information security, realize that CSO, Stands for Chief Scapegoat Officer, <laughs> uh, and uh, even I mean, even so, there's a thing called Spaff's Law. Eugene Spafford from Purdue Uni- University mm-hmm. um, you know, said this 25 years ago. Um, to the degree is you know, if your if your job is in information security, but you don't have budget, Google it, but you can hear exactly. But it's um, but if you don't have budget uh, to hire staff or, or, or get new products, you know you're Role in the organization is to take the blame when things go wrong. <laughs> um, it, def- it defaults to that bottom layer, yeah. right? <laughs> but, you know, at the end, you know, ultimately the buck has to stop with senior management. And, you know, for the longest time, companies, and, and as it, it, you know, every question goes back to, hey, you know, there's a lot of issues at play. It's not just the one, you know, leaky hole in your tire. Um, is you know, um, the, the tenure of a lot of chief security officers is so short because they're put in impossible positions. But... Uh, you know, it, it's gotten to the point, you know, the SEC is getting involved and we're saying, you know, um, information security is no longer, um, you know, just this back office issue. It, it can affect national security. It could affect, you know, bottom line. It's, it's affecting critical infrastructure. So it's slowly turning, you know, into a board issue. Um, that, so ultimately it's going to be the, the CEO who's going to bear that responsibility. Well, let's talk uh, about that because that's a that's a culture change, right? Because yeah. what Simone was talking about traditionally, those decisions uh, rested with the CISO, okay, and mm-hmm. by the way, shared with the HR department because they're the ones trying to hire these people. But I think that's wrong, right? What you said, Ben, is right. It, this is a senior executive team decision, so we need to arm the leader, the security leaders, with the ability to show how we buy down risk with this approach. Then the senior leaders of the company can make those decisions along with all the other business risks they have to deal with. And it gets it right in their lap. And that's the culture change that has to happen, I think. Well, and Rick, the reality too is that every role within, I mean, every company has evolved into some form of a tech company, whether that's Mm. their core business operations or not. We're just so ingrained. And so I always kind of chuckle to myself when you go into an organization, even our own office and, you know, the IT desk is literally in a room like a fishbowl with like a door that covers it because they're sequestered off on the side. And you're going, why? Like, this is <laughs> not just one little enclave of the organization. It's actually kind of everything we do is reliant on it. So right. just culturally, like we actually physically sometimes partition them. It's yeah, insane. that's right. Put them in a, in a fishbowl. I like the way you said that. We're not allowed to talk to those people. Okay. Right. <laughs> <laughs> Just feed them a little bit of food and like yeah, walk right. off. Right. Close the door. <laughs> yeah, again, yeah, you know, it really, you know, every, you know, every company now is a, is an IT company. I mean, even uh, 
you know, is, you know, when systems, I mean, in hospitals, for example, you know, IT goes down. I wouldn't say hospitals go into the dark age, but, um, but you know, we're, we're so overly reliant on it, which is, you know, countless benefits. Uh, but, you know, there's, you know, significant risks also. And I think one of the issues with, you know, IT also is that it's so easy to build things and do things. Um, security is often brought in at the end. You know, no one uh, builds a, you know, 50-story office building uh, without, you know, architectural review, permits, et cetera, et cetera. But, you know, how many companies have rolled out, you know, the equivalent of a, you know, a 50-story office building without, you know, due diligence? IT is so easy to do, especially with cloud computing. Um, you could get it out there, but you don't understand, you know, the, these problems until, until much later. And it's like the, you know, Millennium Tower, you know, that, you know, that, when the foundation, you know, that's a perfect example, you know, uh, uh, that poor foundation um, is affecting the lives of a lot of people. And it was something that could have been fixed early on. Uh, but now, you know, once the skyscraper's up, you know, trying to redo the foundation is uh, extremely expensive, uh, you know, on, on a lot of different levels. You were talking about how IT has infiltrated every company, you know, like the mm -hmm. cement company or like the MGM studios in this recent hack. I was listening to an interview this week, uh, two women who weren't in Las Vegas because of uh, the casinos. They were there for shopping and other things. Mm -hmm. But they took a stroll through the casino during all this, and, you know, it was empty, right? Yeah. Because nothing worked. And they were thinking, oh, isn't this quaint? Okay, it's so beautiful. <laughs> but none of the services actually yeah. worked. Uh, you know, these guys are ostensibly, ostensibly a gambling casino. Uh, but all their IT services were turned off, so <laughs> it's right. Yeah. Well, Even I think, I, you know, Bruce Schneier wrote about, you know, in the old days, you know, you'd a farmer would buy a uh, a tractor, he'd buy his John Deere and do his work. I mean, now when you buy uh, a John Deere piece of equipment, you know, you're buying a computer uh, which does farming equipment, and these computers now uh, have licensing, um, there's, you know, end user licensing agreements, there's updates. Um, and there's a lot they can and can't do. So it, it, it's so embedded, literally and figuratively, in you know, every aspect of our lives in IT. And, um, so that's uh, the culture change, right? It's yeah, instead yeah. of, and like, like Simone said, it, these folks should not be the fish in the fishbowl, right? They, mm -hmm. they, they are integral to how well the business is going to do, True. and uh, we need to treat it that way. Yeah. yeah. Well, so I, I want to leave us with this parting question. I'll give you both a chance to, to kind of answer it. As a takeaway, if you were to identify one thing in the in the sort of the low hanging fruit that could start to change this culture paradigm and start to focus the industry on the long term solutions, what would be your first starting point? I know what mine would be, but Ben, what do you think? Oh, um, uh, <laughs> <laughs> just um, I, mean, I just say you know uh, you know. Um, stop and, you know, figure, you know, really understand, you know, what your IT issues are, you know, what your needs are, uh, what your goals are, um, and understand how to, you know, get security involved in that. So I'll uh, piggyback off that, right? Mm -hmm. I would call that decide what your strategy and tactics are. Mm -hmm. um, but the first step in solving this problem, I think, is being able to assess your current workforce mm -hmm. on how good they are at pursuing those strategies and tactics. So you can make a decision about training resources in the future. That's what I would do. Yeah. That's great. Well, Ben, Rick, thank you so much for joining for this discussion. Always a ton of fun. Thanks, Simone. That was fun. Okay. Thank you. Great.